and all of a sudden I saw you guys like coming, exiting a corner, and I just, I was like, I think, was that a Mercedes? Whenever you would appear in my rear view mirrors, yeah. it would be <laughs> the most uh, non nice feeling. <laughs> <laughs> from Daniel, where to, bud? <laughs> and I'm like, oh damn, I forgot to tell him where, so I was writing my notes just here now. And, uh, and pick him up from, from, from yeah. I'm looking forward to it, I prepared well now. I got some cool points to ask, really, uh, really some very, very interesting stuff. And I hope um, that you're gonna feel the same at the end of this podcast. What's up, bud? Oh! <laughs> How you going? Very good, you? Good as well. Whoa. Sorry, sorry about that last minute. Uh, no, yes, no we've, got the two kid, we've got the two kids seats in the back. <laughs> I feel I should be in the back. You're going for 30, where's the big party? Um, LA, can you tell, no, can you actually, tell us on the podcast <laughs> so we can all join? I was, so like, was going to ask what you did. I'm, I'm thinking uh, probably Ibiza actually. You've never been still, right? Or you I, have now? I, for like two days. Oh, okay, I went okay. really briefly, but uh, I thought I'd do it properly for my 30th. But you have to, it's your place, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that is, music wise and everything, it's your place. All right, what did you do? Um, for 30, oh, where the hell was I? Well, um, 30, I don't know. In Beta. But it's, it's in the middle of the season for me, and I was. Uh, what month was are you? Like, uh, end of June, close to you actually. Okay. Your first July, no? Yeah. Yeah. I know everything about you, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> If it's okay, we're doing one little prank because my my assistant is in love with amongst, me. Um, <laughs> that's a bit self-confident, <laughs> isn't it? Eh? <laughs> but of course, you, uh, we all know you have quite a few of the women uh, F1 fans on your side. I think the large majority, and so my assistant is a huge, uh, <laughs> huge fan of yours. Oh, she is. And so I was we're going to do a bit of a prank. I think now. Let's see. <laughs> Now that I met you Seems to come true I guess I'm crazy 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 in love Hello Hello Alina <laughs> My love <laughs> I, I brought you all the way from Australia. You did? Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. That's very nice of you. <laughs> Let's hug it out. Let's hug it out. It's okay. Are, are we in the clip too? Uh, we could do that, yeah. <laughs> very nice to meet you. Hi, guys. Hello. I'm Justin. Hi, Daniel. You insisted. I was like... All right. Hi, Daniel. Thank you very much for taking the time. No worries. <laughs> and thank you very much for making my dear assistant, Alina, her the, probably the best moment of her month or something. She'll that, remember that forever. So thanks yeah, a lot. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. I actually, uh, it was emotional. It was quite a hug. <laughs> she really embraced me. <laughs> you felt the love there, yeah? Yeah, it was, it was quite a warm soul. Yeah, well, you, te you tend to have that impact on the women around the world, <laughs> huh? I guess, as you, as you know. Um, I, wanna, I would love to start first like, with um, going back to childhood because I think there's so many like great stories there and, and you have one of the more, ch you've had one of the more challenging paths also because coming all the way from Perth uh, mm -hmm. to the world of, to the world epicenter of racing is a hell of a long way. Um, maybe uh, start off with, where, do you remember that one moment where like the dream clicked and you said, okay, I want to be a Formula One racing driver? Is there that one moment? Probably not. To be honest, like I, I loved, I loved racing. I mean, I love cars. I love motorsports growing up. And so my childhood consisted of, um, you know, weekends, some weekends spent at racetracks cause my dad was, was racing. Um, not to, not to put him down, but just a local kind of series. It wasn't, it was just a hobby for him at that, at that point. So he was um, rubbish. So, well, I, <laughs> I actually, he, till this day, he can still heel and toe 10 times better than me. Um, so I think he's, there's probably more motorsport in his DNA actually, 
but uh, I guess he never had really the opportunity to, to pursue it any further. But um, but yes, yeah, so I, w- I was growing up at the racetrack, so I was very familiar with the noise, the the smell of race cars from a from a young age. And then you know when I was at home, I was scrolling through TV channels trying to find any any form of motorsport I could. So um, so it was definitely in me from a young age, but. I mean, I, I hear some people say, you know, when I was five years old, I knew I, I was going to be an F1 driver or something. And I do struggle to believe that because who knows what you want, you know, at such a young age. Um, but yeah, as I got, I think as I started going through high school um, and kind of understanding I wasn't really passionate about anything other than racing, I think that's when it kind of turned. And then I, I put a bit more effort into it and figured it could, it could work. But it probably wasn't until Leah, like 16, 17 years old. Sounds a bit similar than, than in, uh, in my case that my mom is also convinced that I got all my talent from her and not from my dad. So it's probably similar in your case. The talent has come from the mom then uh, <laughs> in, what you're, in what you're saying. <laughs> no, my dad's good. My dad's good. Um, but yeah, definitely like just, I mean, being in mom's arms, you know, as a kid and, and being at the track and um, I don't know, she, they, they all contributed. And as you touched on, like coming across you know, from Australia across the across the pond to, to Europe. That was, I think, not easy as a parent to let your son go and do that. And I did it when I was 17. And actually, I was still quite a young 17 year old. I wasn't I was quite immature, I guess. And I, I didn't think I was prepared to do it. Um, so for my parents to kind of put that trust and that support in me, that was that was huge. So, yeah, I certainly owe a lot to them for, I guess, giving me that head start you know without pushing me though they never pushed me to do it really. and arriving in europe that was really uh, do you remember that also as a tough time like so far away from friends family um mm-hmm. and it's that dream that then kept you going is that the way or a- absolutely um and i think i was fortunately i was still kind of young and naive enough to to know any better so i was, I was living in an apartment in a in a small town in italy with population of probably a thousand people average age of probably 97 um no internet no no nothing you know so um so my days consisted of waking up going to the gym eating lunch going to the gym sleeping um oh my goodness. but i didn't know better and that was like i was like well every other driver is doing this and and every current f1 driver was doing this so this is what has to be done and so i actually i didn't really get homesick or feel sorry for myself because in my head it was just what needed to be done and the weekends it was lonely but the weekends racing kept me satisfied enough that when I was home, it was, I had enough to look forward to. And may I ask how you found your way to pay your way into that racing? Was it a lot yep. than just yourself hustling and, and finding, <laughs> finding that next Helmut Marko to, to support you? Or what was the, the way in the early days? Yeah, that was, so the first, so 2007 was the first year I moved to, to Europe. And so we had enough funding that year, you know, so between, so dad built a business uh, over the course of his life and, um, so that paid for the majority. And then we had some family friends who also had their own businesses who chipped in a bit here and there. So it all helped. Um, but then to do a second year with, you know, a bit more of a budget was going to be tight. So really the objective in 2007 was to do enough to get the eye of, of Red Bull. You know, there was at that time, there was Red Bull, there was Toyota Young Drivers Program. There was a few. Um, so it was to try and get one of them. But Red Bull was like, as a junior coming up, and seeing like the Red Bull painted cars, like they were the targets. They were the ones to, to be a part of or to beat. And uh, so that was my target. And then I, I got an email at the end of 2017 from, from Red Bull and they asked if I wanted to do, well, they asked if I wanted to do it. Of course I was gonna do it, but they're, they're like junior evaluation test to, to see if I, I could be part of the program in, in 2008. And that's where I met Helmer and that's where it all started, yeah. And that was them coming towards you? Yeah. So, wow, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, that was, so I, I had, um, I mean, I and I had no podiums that year, but I, I had a lot of fourth places. And a lot of the time I was, let's say, splitting some of the Red Bull cars and, and whatever. And I wasn't necessarily in a, a top team. So I think they just recognized that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I yeah, I, I'm sure there was a bit of, I don't know. I don't know if there was much else going on in the background, to be honest, but I, I certainly wasn't doing any hustling. Like I was, I was too young to hustle, but uh, it worked out. It worked out well. And then the test was um, pretty intense. Like you get five laps to pretty much show what you got. 
Um, but that pressure for me was like so exciting and I just, I really felt like it was my real opportunity. You've got to give it to Helmut Marko in terms of finding huge talents. He's really had a great track record over the years of finding really special, special drivers, hasn't he? Uh, absolutely. You know, Helmut was, I mean, yeah, critical in, in my, my career and, and my growth as a driver. Um, critical, crucial. Crucial is probably the, the better word. Um, I mean, I signed the contract then and there at the tests. I still had, you know, my, my gear on. And, um, but, you know, it was, he was always very passionate he cared and because he cared so much he was also very you know hard sometimes and firm but anytime i finished a conversation with him on the phone i knew where i stood and what he expected so it certainly it certainly made me grow up quick and and i i yeah respect him a lot for that and um wasn't always nice seeing his phone uh, seeing his his name pop up <laughs> you, on your you phone would sometimes you're like, get the chills yeah like, oh <laughs> do i really want to add to it but you're like if i don't answer it now i'm just gonna have to do it later so i was like all right and then sometimes you just have to listen and nod and, and suck it up. Could, uh, just a dear listener, if you're not, of course, some of you won't know, but Helmut Marko is the head of Red Bull Motorsports, and he is the guy who's, who picks the talent and also uh, sort of is the lead consultant or sort of boss even of the Red Bull Formula One team. Uh, so what was the worst telephone call that you heard from him? The one where it was uh, uh, the most intense. <laughs> Can you fill well, us in? And how, I, how, that, how you take that as a young driver then? Uh, I mean, so I'll tell you one that I got, for example, my okay. first year in Williams. By the not way, from Helmer. No, no, not from, not from Helmer. But by the way, please, if you, whenever you, you can think of a question coming my way, always happy. Huh? It, it, it's, All right. It's, it's awesome. nice. If, but no worries, just if, if something comes. Um, so uh, Sam Michael, the boss of Williams. Australian. My first, first year, a fellow Australian, fellow yeah. tough guy. Um, <laughs> after four races, I crashed on the first lap. He calls me after the race. Uh, Nico, you were totally useless to the team this weekend. That's it. Oh my goodness, I was a young guy, 20 years, first four, f fourth race in F1, and this guy was for me the Helmut Marco because I had so much respect. You were totally useless. To the, I to still the whole get, team I still well. get the shakes. That's, and that, they're the worst ones when there's no swear words. Like, so it's oh yeah, not exactly. Like, yeah. When they're real words, <laughs> that's when it hurts more. Yeah. Um, so the, the, so the hel bomb. Helmut was, <laughs> Helmut was um, it was the start of 2010, so it was my first season in uh, World Series by Renault at that time um, and I was coming into the season you know young driver hot and one of the favorites and um, about a few, or two weeks before the first test and we only had two tests so it was limited but uh, basically I, I had a crash on my mountain bike and uh, fractured my wrist and uh, I knew I couldn't do the first test like I could hardly move my, my hand but I still flew to Jerez in Spain to try and show that I was going to at least try and, and I did the outlap and I came straight back to the pits and I, I just said, sorry guys, I can't. So then my phone rings, <laughs> helmet. Oh, geez. what happened? I was like, I, I really tried, I, I, I couldn't. I was like, I'm so sorry, but I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll let it heal and don't worry, I'll, I'll be ready for the first race. And did you think maybe that goes, was it? That was it for me and my Red Bull? Uh, uh, I knew it was or? gonna be tough because then the next words were, it was very, a lot of silence and then, <laughs> It still kissed me. <laughs> You're an idiot. And hung up. That's it? Yeah. Holy moly. <laughs> and I know it's like, as I said, oh he could have goodness. gone and said, You're an effing this and an effing oh that. My goodness. That would have been easier, but just like, You're an idiot and hung up. I was just like, Oh. So, yeah. So I did the next test in Magni Cour. It was probably about 10 days later. And I remember all the hairpins because I couldn't get enough um, rotation with my wrist. I was just like one hand. But that, that's where I started and, and that was, it all just got better then. But I got pole in the first race, actually. Awesome. So that's that the way to right. come back, huh? <laughs> but that's yeah, there was a few calls. That's fight back. A <laughs> few calls from Helmut. Oh, but jeez. Yeah. He's so right. one-handed Kubica, no problem, huh? Doable. Yeah. I, like you'd get <laughs> Not into... that he one-hands it, but <laughs> he has less of the second hand, so... It's like what he's doing also is is impressive and I think it's cool to see him back. Um, I, it's a shame to see the, the situation the team's in. Yeah, of course. I think for any F1 fan to see a, a team like Williams be struggling like that, it's not. It's obviously not cool, but um, to see him back on the grid and his whole story is amazing. But um, yeah, it's when you need more lock, that's where it's gonna struggle, but uh, but he's all right. He's been through a lot, so he's driving an F1's easy for him now. <laughs> No, big big respect for him. Uh, I still I want to come back a little bit. Um, you have the coolest nickname I find, like for any sports personality or whatever, because it just fits so well. 
uh, the honey badger. Yeah. <laughs> and I just want to go through uh, like where where it happened because I of course uh, had to study quite a lot about your life uh, this morning <laughs> and yesterday. And so there was this really nice story of you've not always been the honey badger mm -hmm. because when you were starting out in karting, I don't know, 13 years old or or whatever, you were. Um, really uh, shy and insecure and not going for those opportunities and sort of holding back and and not wanting to uh, to cause uh, uh, to oh, cause a mess is that yeah. is that a bit the truth yeah definitely like i was i was never really a fan of conflict you know and and i was um so a lot of the time racing i was fast enough but you know i'd get close to the guy in the lead or whatever and i wouldn't always pull the trigger and i was hesitant so for a lot of years i was like just had the speed but didn't have that tenacity or it, it just it looked like I just didn't want it bad enough and, and at that age yeah I probably thought that was true I didn't really know um, but then I think over the years and I had a few driver coaches in karting and, and they they hardened me up a little and you know by the kind of the end of my karting career I was you know I got that that kind of killer instinct in me and I think I always I mean you always have it in you but you just yeah I, you, you, I sometimes just needed someone to reinforce it, you know, that I that I was strong enough, basically. Um, so, yeah, I, I got it in karting and eventually I entered that phase of my career being, I thought, quite badass on the track. Um, but then, like, fast forwarding a bit to then when I got to F1, it felt like I was starting back at square one, you know, in karting and the cars are fast. These drivers have been here a lot longer than me. They're, you know, older and more experienced and... Like I, I wasn't, I was just a bit intimidated probably and overwhelmed by the whole environment. So I had to kind of start from scratch again, but I knew it was in me because again, I'd, I'd proved it in the karting, um, but it just took time. So the, the honey badger name, um, it came from, so my, my trainer at the time, Stu, um, he was, I think he'd seen one of the documentaries on it or he'd seen something on, on YouTube and um, and he came up, he showed me the video and he goes, mate, this is, this is you. He's like, I know this is you because you're obviously you're nice and you seem friendly and you are cuddly and cute and whatever. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's like, you have this, you have this, you know, killer instinct in you and you can make this switch. And I think this, this fits you perfectly. And it's up to you now to, you know, run with it and, and show everyone that you can be this, this character. So um, I made a point when I got to Red Bull in 2014, I was like, this is my big opportunity. I'll be racing at the front. I can't be pushed around because if I get pushed around from the first race, it's, it's going to continue like that. So, uh, that was it. And I felt that's when I really adopted the honey badger. And that's when it's, I felt it, it flourished and a lot of big overtakes. And I, I went from the nice guy to being like the quite aggressive racer, but not aggressive, just strong and determined and had a lot of conviction. Yeah. That's a nice, so just to uh, fill in one more time for the honey badger, um, the honey badger <laughs> is a complete nutcase, by the way. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's, he's, as you said, cute and cuddly, but he will attack pythons and tigers. Yes. <laughs> and they will be scared of him. Yes. So this guy is proper, like, he's the most fearless animal in the animal kingdom. Yes. So I think it's really, uh, it's such a cool animal and such a cool comparison. But also just uh, one more time coming a little bit back, um, in the stories of big su successful people, there's always these... Um, moments of guides coming in mm -hmm. and giving this small uh, twist and then and, and, and create uh, helping to give this huge progress and i think in your in your path to becoming a honey badger which um i think is so so cool because to improve as a human being is really difficult and to adapt your approach is really difficult so from being like someone who holds back and is scared of conflict to the complete opposite to really being always courageous and going right into the conflict and the challenge yeah. uh, is a big transition. I think that's really, really inspiring uh, for, for even for me and for everybody who's listening. And um, maybe the two guides was one which I read um, the day where you really like you were so fast and you just lost or held back in practice um, because you just had so much respect for the guys in front who were actually slower, mm -hmm. but you didn't want to create conflict and pass them. And then on the way home, your dad seems to have quite a strong character as well yeah. and seems to expect his son uh, to push in life, I guess. I don't know if that's correct. And he showed you his extreme disappointment at why you wouldn't just hit it and, and, and go for it. Is that right? And was that also yeah. a little bit of a turning moment for you? That, that was that that day was um, I never talked about it much. But yeah, you just described it. I was in practice 
So he'd taken a day off work and, you know, these were still in the days where he's trying to build his business and he's working six, seven days a week. So any time he took off to take me karting was yeah, a sacrifice. So he'd taken a day off work. Um, I just basically sat behind these two guys fighting in practice and I, I was just, I just wasn't there, you know, I was just there to be there. And uh, so he, I could tell as soon as I got out of the cart, his look, I was like, he's, he's pissed. Um, so we put the cart and I was, exp- I know a thing or two about critical looks on parents. <laughs> it's again, it's, it's, it's when they don't, when they say little, that's what hurts the most. You know, if he went and flipped it, I'd, I'd be like, all right. But the, the silent treatment is always the worst from, from anyone that you, you respect or, or love. So, um, so there was another practice later that day, but as soon as we got back to the, the trailer, he put the cart straight in the trailer and I knew I was like, oh. And we drove home, nothing, no words, no nothing. And uh, I remember calling one of my friends that night and I said, look, I, I practiced today. It, it, I was just not really there. And uh, I, I think it's, I think I'm done. Like I don't expect to ever drive again. Like I think my dad will, he's not gonna let me ever race again. So uh, I thought my day was, my, my career, so to speak, was done. And oh, I would have been- Oh, that's hard though. Yeah, I was probably 11 at that time. So, you know what though, I look back and I, like my dad is, yeah, he's firm, but he's not, I don't, I wouldn't consider him, you know, too hard or too pushy. He always gave me every opportunity to go and do it myself. But uh, I guess if he felt like I wasn't applying myself, he would just remind me. But uh, yeah, that was, that was an interesting one. So, but again, I knew, I knew, I knew what was expected and a bit like with helmet, you know, you, you knew once you finished that conversation, what was required to move forward. But now today you're thankful for that firmness from your dad, no? Because yeah. he's helped make you into who you are today in that way, right? And yeah. where you are today. I, absolutely. And you, you know, I look, I look at even just things that I do now and whether it's on track or off track. And I guess you just get to an age where you finally appreciate your parents and what they've done for you and the way they brought you up. You know, at times I was like, I thought that was so strict and not letting me sleep at a friend's house or something. But there's all there's reasons for everything and and now i'm so grateful for my upbringing and you know i think they had a a great balance with allowing me to do my own thing but still keeping a bit of a leash on me and keeping me in line um i'm not a parent but i could only imagine i mean maybe you can explain but i guess finding that balance with with kids and giving them enough freedom to for them not to hate you but also letting them know that there's still guidelines and and yeah i don't know rules to follow tough Oh, very tough. It's mm. the, the toughest uh, job in the world. Yeah, you will. You will uh, <laughs> um, get to know it one day. <laughs> yeah. Um, one more. One more moment of becoming a honey badger. You're on the grid. You're second. There's the other guy who's the probably the big guy who's uh, mm-hmm. uh, the favorite to win. Yeah. And your coach, not your dad this time, but a coach that came into your life, another guide, um, like gave you a bit of a push to go into a really big moment of discomfort. But again, you learned a lot. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that was. So that was, um, that was with Michael. Um, so he was, so I had, uh, um, when was that probably? Yeah, it would have been maybe 14 or something. And, uh, basically we're on the grid and, you know, we, we were like fierce rivals through the whole championship and competition. And, um, we knew that we didn't really like each other cause we were rivals, but we're there and I'm obviously young and whatever naive and, and he goes, go up and wish him good luck and I kind of laughed I was like what, <laughs> like, what are you talking about <laughs> shut up <laughs> um no like go do it he goes he's not expecting it it's just before the race he's trying to focus and get in his get in his rhythm whatever it's like you will completely break him if you go up shake his hand and wish him good luck he'll be he'll be lost he won't know what to do and I did it and I could tell straight away when I did it I mean it was awkward for me but it was more awkward for him and I was just like I get it. I see. I see what he just got me to do, and it was it was great. And that was like just little things along the way. Like I think they're so fun. Like these little mind games, and but that was one that definitely stood out for me. And the guy did he look like he saw a ghost? In that yeah. Then. Yeah. So I like not to exaggerate, but I do remember his handshake. It was like a bit limp, and it was just he was just completely caught off guard, completely, and it it, it messed with him. So yeah. I like it. Uh, that part of that like s- psychology behind any sport, I, I really enjoy. Uh, learning to play the mind games there. Huh? <laughs> trying, <laughs> trying. 
Um, you would have had a few, I'm sure. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I had yeah. Michael Schumacher as my teammate. So this oh, guy, this guy, three years, of Mr. Course. Mind Games, the absolute master. And he doesn't even have to think about it. It just comes natural to him. Just, <laughs> it's, just, it's just the way he, the way he is. So way he operates. Uh, th that was a big, big, um, big, big learning curve. Yeah. I guess, and I guess you took a lot from that. Yeah, huge. No, no, huge. Just the, the, the warrior mentality, really. The warrior mentality that, that uh, Michael had is just phenomenal. And living and breathing it every, every single day. And, and, okay, sometimes too extreme, but always trying to get into my head. From the morning till the evening, just trying to get into my head. Yeah. And just trying to ruin my self-confidence. <laughs> Did you always know, or it only clicked after, like, ah, that's what he was doing? Or when he approached you, for example, yeah. you knew straight away what he was doing? No, I'm quite, I'm quite aware. I'm a very uh, self-aware person and, and yeah. aware of moments. I also learned that along the years. So I would notice, but even if you notice, nonetheless, it still, it still hits you hard. And I mean, there's so many examples. One example, Monaco qualifying. Mm -hmm. there's, only, uh, there's only one toilet in the garage, as you know. Uh, I don't know, in Red Bull, yes, but in Mercedes, yes. there's only one toilet, toilet in the garage. I don't even know if we got and, one. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and so he's in the toilet, and I go down, and it's 10 minutes before, and I know that, okay, I have my two-minute session now for the last pee, and then jump in the car and go, qualifying. Mm -hmm. And so I knock on the door because the door is locked, and I'm like, uh, Nico here, please let me in, because usually it's the mechanics who will then, of course, know that in this moment I'm, I priority. have to be the priority. Yep. No answer, nothing. So I'm like knocking, knocking, no answer, nothing, locked. But I can hear that someone's in there. So here was Michael in the toilet, leaning against the wall, looking at his watch. And he knew that if, but if, if as long as he made it out with three minutes to go, he could still just about jump in the car, put the seatbelts and go before losing actual time and ruining the whole team strategy of qualifying. <laughs> so he's in there looking at his watch, just like chilling out, counting down. <laughs> And I'm outside full panic Ruthless. mode. I'm in full panic mode because I need to, I can't go in qualifying with a full bladder. It, it will sucks. ruin my, it absolutely sucks like anything. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's no options for me. So full panic. And, uh, and so I went for the uh, oil bucket option in the court. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> Did you really? Yes. It was, this, it was not even a bucket. It was like this plate or whatever. I don't know. There was no option and mechanics running, working around and I'm just there, in the, you know. And even though, so I managed to uh, to do the what I needed to do, but mm -hmm. the panic had such an impact on my on my qualifying. And so whilst I'm, whilst I'm with my oil bucket, the door opens. Michael chills out, walks out. As soon as he leaves from the corner, he starts walking faster because <laughs> so, he knows it's like it's like Times. two seconds to go to qualifying. And these games all day long, all day long. And for example, also one of his main missions was never to show that I existed in his life. Like he would never in any meetings. Never ever ask, oh, what was done on Nico's car? Or, hey, Nico, uh, what, did uh, what do you think there? But really? not once in three years. Like, I, I did not exist. So he, he wouldn't wow. show me at all that, I'm, that I even play a tiny role in his mind at any time. It was like so, like, so warrior uh, extreme. Um, but, but, you know, nothing against that. It's, it's a great uh, sports yeah. approach. And he never, he never exaggerated. It was always uh, the fine line. Um, never like unfair or evil or things like that. Always the fine but psychological just. line. But uh, <laughs> what a, I mean, and, uh, and every day, you know, it's like, so but I learned a lot. As you say, that obviously it takes something away from you, but also that, that requires a lot of energy, I think, to constantly be on that, be one step ahead and, and play those games, I guess. I mean, it probably does come fairly natural to some people, but I think it's still, it has to take something away from them, even though, they still might be getting the upper hand, like to constantly think about, oh, what can I do? And I'll make sure I don't mention his name because I don't want him to <laughs> exist. And so, it, yeah, interesting. Well, but that's with, cool. With Michael, I think it really came so naturally. Okay. He lived and breathed it. Um, with me, it's, I'm the opposite of that. So I had to, I had to learn it. I had to learn it, especially with, with Lewis and in the team, because you have to stand up and, and think about those things mm -hmm. uh, and, and fight against those things and into those things. Otherwise, there's no chance. Uh, so I really had to uh, also change quite a lot. And that was tough because I always had to think about it. It would never come naturally. Always think, OK, I have to do this now, even if it's hell discomfort. Yeah. Uh, I have to do it because I know that it's going to put him some self-doubt. Um, and a as you know, that's part of the yeah. part of the game. <laughs> but for me, it's, it's really, uh, really not so not so natural. Um, I want to go into some of your best moments of F1. 
so far the most beautiful <laughs> the reason for doing the sport because it's just so amazing what would the one stand out i mean the <laughs> It's the obvious one, but considering you're in the room, I have you to thank for... No, not that one. Bit. <laughs> <laughs> not that one. Come on. Was that later in the in the chat? Um, well, you wanted me to bring it up, didn't you? <laughs> no, no, no. It's that one, yeah. Oh, I mean, look, that was... That was painful for me. <laughs> yeah. But from what I understand, you did very well to get through. I mean, you second. You still you still got yeah. second. So, yeah. so we're talking about uh, June the 8th, 2014. You remember Montreal. the Montreal. How come? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> first ever win. First ever win. And uh, the cra I mean, the race was crazy. So I just, I mean, it was nice to, I think it's always nice, obviously, to, winning's winning, but to win a race that's eventful and that does get remembered, that's also quite cool. Um, and I remember I was kind of, whatever, fourth, fifth through the race. And I think Perez was in third doing well. But all of a sudden, I just remember seeing, and I knew you guys were so fast, you and Lewis. And all of a sudden I saw you guys like coming, exiting a corner. And I just, I was like, I think, was that a Mercedes? And then I see two and I'm like, what the hell? And then my engineers, like they, they got problems. They got problems like, come on, push, push. And if you can get Perez. And I just winning this thing. And, uh, but it just happened so quickly. And I was like, holy crap. Like all of a sudden, like I was just like maybe a podium and there was like a win could be on today. And uh, and then, yeah, I, I won't go into how it all happened, but that was just a crazy race and crazy feeling. And um, passing a Mercedes down a straight, <laughs> that was that was pretty rare, <laughs> far and few between. So doing that was pretty, um, yeah, pretty unique. Um, and actually I remember, so I passed you down the, the DRS straight before the last chicane with about two or three laps to go. And I think because I had such a run and the DRS was on, I braked quite late into the into the chicane. And I remember literally <laughs> losing the rear into the chicane. And I was like, oh my gosh, could you imagine if I if I put it in the wall going for the lead? But um, so yeah, the moments that followed. So I hit the lead and all I remember was I literally told myself, I was like, please hands and feet still work. <laughs> Like I was, I was worried in a way that I would forget upshifting and I like my hands would just freeze. And, uh, and I was just like, come on. Like I believed I could do it, but it was a weird feeling. I was like, I just, I had a fear that maybe I would just completely disintegrate under the pressure of, of about to winning my first ever race. But, but that was uh, two opposites now. Cause you said you believed you could do it, but you had the fear that you would disintegrate cause it's <laughs> such an extreme situation and, until, which, which one then yes yeah, so i mean as a driver i always believed and, and i believed i belonged there and, and that season was going well so i i believed that it was all i was good to go but because it was unfamiliar it was the first time i'd ever led a race i was like holy shit just make sure things still work so it was like i guess a in a way like a split second of fear being like this is this is foreign to me and I was like, I, I believe I'm good for it, but you just don't know until you're in that position. But I remember getting through turn one and two, everything was cool. I was like, all right, just stay calm and then uh, and then get it done. But um, I think the cool thing about that day, probably more than anything is, and I'd like to hear your thoughts, first win, because it's something you, you do dream of as a kid, even if you don't believe it, you know, until later in your career, but it is a dream since a kid. I was worried it would just be a big blur and I wouldn't remember anything, but I, I do remember so much of it quite vividly and standing on the podium. That was something in a way it's like I'd kind of visualized before and everything just felt so amazing and so real. So I was just really stoked that it wasn't a blur and I could really enjoy the moment and I still remember the moment, but your first win, how, how was that? A blur or... Uh, Somewhere my, in the my, yeah, my first win was 2012, then China, mm -hmm. and um, it had been such a long time. It was 111 races, so it was like forever. And I, I, I that would have been a, a GP2. Your, your my, yeah, my first win was 2012. Yeah, so it's yeah, been yeah, a long GP2. time. Yeah, GP2 2005. Or since your first F1 2005 race, 2005, and was the last win, which was in GP2. So I never won F1 until 2012, which was oh. which was like six years and 111 okay. races into my career. And again, we had a terrible car that year, so there was no chance. And, and I didn't believe, I, I probably didn't even believe I'd ever win a race at that, at that point, because um, I'm not the guy who has that huge self-belief, um, never, never did have. 
and uh, yeah, it was just it's just amazing, so powerful, and so it's just the most extreme emotions to win in sports, and then to share it with your your friends, family, the millions watching, mm -hmm. and that's w what I'll miss now forever because you you'll never get that again in the rest of the life. That extreme, uh, exhilarating uh, excess of, of powerful emotions. I don't think it happens again. It's much slower in the rest of life. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of scared so. about that. Like, <laughs> I don't know, living such a high. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, trying to fulfill that high for the rest of your life. That's, I don't want to say I'm scared, but yeah, I'm curious to know what it is that's going to find that or something close to that. But yeah. is that something that you, uh, you said you're, you're missing, but do you think you will find it through another avenue or are you going to take up skydiving or something to yeah. get that adrenaline I, I don't know no so damn i don't think it's ever going to be there again the, the the feelings of of winning that first race or winning monaco and you've done mm -hmm. all those as well or or winning championship i don't think ever again the the party afterwards with friends <laughs> it's just yeah. unbelievable memories and and so lucky we're so lucky in sports to be able to experience those those moments and then there's nothing else after that i mean in jobs you're not, no way you're going to have that thrill. It doesn't matter. I just got a huge deal yesterday, actually. But it just, it's, it's months in the making and suddenly I get an email where it says, uh, okay, we'll do Congrats. it. Well, great. Thank you very much. You, you who, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. But there's no way, I mean, there's going to be any thrill. So that's, that's a pity, but that's the way it is. And just got to look back after that. I mean, in jobs, it's just so lucky and just so amazing. And and uh, always keep the book there in the next to you where where those memories are kept so you can from time to time look back at those at those pictures and that is the challenge for all of us after sports because it's just so damn extreme mm -hmm. and then after sports it's it, it's gone and you and it goes away and to get used to that new life where that's not there anymore uh, it, it's 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 a challenge for for all of us yeah which we which we need to go through um, yeah but fine so it is just takes a bit of time um, it's it's a good perspective though when you say like at least you you look back on it with it was a privilege you know and it was amazing to have, have at least have have had an opportunity to to live that life and to do it so and it, it it's never going to last forever but yeah if you look back with it on that positive take as opposed to the negative of oh i'm never going to get that again then i think that's half half your battle yeah the never going to get that again remains though <laughs> <laughs> um okay uh, monaco 2016 Oh. No, what the hell? Oh, damn. So this is another tough moment. Monaco 2016. Yeah. You got, uh, um, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I'm may, smiling may I, No, but it's, no. 18 is the one you smile about. 16, you're not smiling yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. Six, six, 16. I said, yeah, I'm smiling now. I wasn't there. Ah, okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Barcelona, I don't know if I'm allowed to use the word shafted, but I think you got a bit shafted by your team there. And the little young uh, young kid from the block uh, got benefited with strategy. So Verstappen got his first win. And yeah. then you go to Monaco and you're... Um, you're leading the race, easy win, easy yeah. win. And then you get robbed by bad luck or whatever, because the team messes up the pit stop. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with a, a situation like that? Two such extreme races, setbacks, horrible. I mean, it's like pure darkness, isn't it? How do you deal with that in, the, in those moments? That's yeah, I think having him back to back, um, that was tough. I'd never I'd never really had that uh, I guess gone through that experience before and and we, we went winless in 2015 um so you know 2016 would come in barcelona we're in that position thanks to you guys um but yeah we we're leading the whole race really from lap one after that that safety car and um i was two seconds a lap slower than you by the way <laughs> you were i was right behind you <laughs> In Barcelona. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, no, wrong, wrong race. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, 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 um, Monaco. No, no. Barcelona. <laughs> I, I cleared the way for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Barcelona happened, and I was obviously massively upset because I felt a win was was lost through strategy. Um, so I came into Monaco with a bit of a chip on my shoulder, I guess. And yeah, the weekend was dominant. Pole, my first ever pole in F1. So that was a, a massive moment. And I think to do it in Monaco is unique. Uh, and then the race, it started wet and any street circuit in the wet is, it normally spells chaos. Like, especially if you're on pole and you got pole in the dry, you oh. don't want to wake up to rain on Sunday morning. It's just, it's the truth. You just don't <laughs> want it. So already Sunday morning, I was like, all right, we got a few curveballs, but I'll, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'll be right. So you try and see and, the positives. Yeah. And yeah. I was, I was like, you know, it's just going to test me, but I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. 
And uh, so through the wet, the first phase of the race, I was actually doing quite well holding holding my own. And then, uh, yeah, pit stop, tires weren't ready. And uh, and that's when Lewis, Lewis got the, the lead and, and won the race. So um, I guess it was the first time in my whole career, actually, that I'd left before the, the debrief. Oh, really? So like after media, I, I, I went straight back home. Um, and I just didn't, I didn't feel like seeing or speaking to anyone. And I did, I knew it wasn't going to be productive as well. That's when Lewis, Lewis got the go and throw a table or something isn't useful. And <laughs> have for, you done that? I haven't. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I haven't. But also I wasn't really in, I wasn't interested in the sympathy. I knew people were going to come up and say, I'm so sorry, but I just needed to be on my own. So, um, yeah, that was, that was tough. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it just, it hurt. It hurt because I think, and, and with racing, unfortunately, there's so many variables, you know, and, and as a driver, you can prepare as well as you can. And, and there's races where I'm sure you felt it. You rock up to a race weekend knowing you are in the best condition of your life and you might have a terrible weekend for reasons unknown or for things out of your control. And that's where it's hard because it's like, yeah, what do I have to do to kind of get this thing going? Um, but Fortunately, I'm positive, and once I let the emotion kind of pass, I looked back on the weekend and I was like, it was a massively positive weekend. I was the fastest, I, I got my first pole, so bring the positives with me to Montreal and, and leave the negatives to for the team to kind of sort out. And that's just with time and, and because naturally you're a, you're, you tend to be a positive person, yeah? So you, yeah. you like, you're able to focus on those positives yeah, with I th time always, yeah? That's, a, that's a big strength, huh, I guess time definitely heals most things and uh, I had I had family with me I had some friends here for that weekend and, and they help you know I think sometimes being on your own is nice and sometimes you need your own space but in terms of getting picked up I think having close friends helps you know and uh, I had some friends from Perth who were here that weekend and yeah they they helped me rally through it so um, yeah and also I've always had that kind of mindset that it could be worse and even a bad a bad day for me that day was a second place in monaco you know like one of the worst True. days of my life was a second place in monaco so i also don't want to i never want to seem like ungrateful or spoiled you know i know the competitor in me will show the frustration but i think the human in me will always appreciate the position i'm in and, and try and see that perspective so it did get worse azerbaijan <laughs> uh, <laughs> azerbaijan um, you're pushing me i, I won't break no, no, but it's, it's no, but it's it's important to to go into <laughs> nah, these uh, absolutely as well as the really beautiful moments to also go into the tough moments because because uh, also for everybody who's listening, um, the tough moments in sport, in your words, actually, you 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 also said racing at the top is absolutely brutal, um, and it's especially because of those tough moments as well. Yeah. Uh, so Azerbaijan now you're you're racing uh, Max, and uh, and you're at fault pri primarily. I'm not, I'm not sure if that was the conclusion, but that's my my opinion anyways and and take him out um and so it's uh i know all about oh uh, your opinion is I, i took him out sorry your opinion is i took him out um uh, my opinion is that you were more at fault is that not was ah, that okay. not the conclusion this podcast is finished <laughs> no but uh, <laughs> anyways anyway this was my opinion that <laughs> no, you, no. more percentage on your side it's all, whatever it's all good I whatever just... um and <laughs> not not important long time ago but uh, <laughs> but okay so both both cars go out um uh, and then how Uh, let's uh, actually maybe on this one I mean for you it's going to be super tough again personally I think similar similar to Monaco did you uh, did you feel a little did you feel also letting down your team in that moment being being such a tough uh, tough thing to cope with yeah it was um, it was tough because I I felt the whole race I didn't feel the whole race had been managed well you know like Max and I were battling and as far as teammates go were battling too hard and I was surprised that the team didn't kind of put a stop to it um, and uh, you know I was yeah I felt like I was giving enough room but a lot of the time you know he was kind of coming up into me and, and banging wheels and that and I'm, I'm all like I I like tough racing and that it's fun and it's cool and it keeps you going but I felt like at times again because we were teammates I was like why isn't the team addressing this um, and I also I maybe it's uh, maybe it's something I should have done different but I, I've never been one to come on the radio and complain too much and be like oh he hit me like what's he doing and because I'm a racer and I, and I you know I, I respect the tough racing but 
I felt like the team should have addressed it. So then, then they pitted me first. So I finally got past him. Um, then they pitted me first, but it was like one of the only tracks in the year where the undercut, sorry, pitting first is not stronger. You know, the overcut works, so staying out longer, you know, because the tires are so slow to warm up on on uh, on such a smooth surface. So they pit me first and I was kind of confused. And then, uh, so naturally he pits after, comes out back in front of me. Sucks. And I'm like, guys, I'm like, we're gonna have the same scenario again. So I might I, I might have said like, is he gonna let me pass or something? Cause I was leading before the, the pit. And let's uh, just say the truth. You said, get the, get in the hell out of yeah, the way now. Pretty much. <laughs> and then my engineer, I remember him saying like, no, like you've got to pass him again. Oh. And I was like, you know what? I, I had no intention obviously of crashing, but I was not surprised. So when I went for it, so I went to do like the kind of dummy. So I moved out, I saw him move out. So I went back in. So at that point there was space and then he's he's kind of uh, made that second move in. And I'm like, oh, I was like that space is now gone. And then there was no way for me to pull out of it. So um, I was just angry, I guess at, the, at that initial moment, I really didn't feel sorry for anyone. I just felt anger how it was kind of all managed i guess um but then the days that, that followed yeah of course i felt sorry for the for the team and, and for it's it's more the you know obviously all the parts we damaged in that crash you know i felt sorry for the people that spent hours putting you know those parts together and making them perfect and, and we've just gone and disintegrated them um, i actually had to pay for my parts did you <laughs> at the time we we uh, i guess it didn't take you to that point <laughs> Not the parts. We we did a little bit, but it was... Oh, you had to yeah. pay as well? There was a little, like... Oh, interesting. ...kind of apology gift for everyone. Okay. But, um, but so then, that's, yeah, how, we, that's how the team manage it? Apology gift and, and also... Yeah, and then we addressed, factory together, we addressed the factory. Yeah. Together? Hand, yeah. hand in hand? Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> yeah. So we went... Uh, when was it? It would have been probably, like, midweek after the race. We were in, in Milton Keynes, and, and we... Um, yeah everyone like for their post-race debrief and Max and I were, were along for that. And, you know, that, that actually felt good to kind of address everyone and I guess to apologize for whether I think it was all my fault or his fault or the team's fault. I think as, as a man and in the position we're in, we have to address it. And I think it's always better speaking to people face to face than over message or over the phone. And that was, um, yeah, but it just, it, I guess it didn't sit that well with me how it was kind of, handled um but that's just what you get when you got too young well he's younger but too young determined drivers you know you get whatever you get pride you get egos in the way and these things can happen so good times well done baku well done <laughs> okay let's go to redemption come on so your greatest race i, I guess monaco um, 2018 would you say the most beautiful and, and or one of the most beautiful and greatest races the 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 outcome yes absolutely the race itself actually sucked you know i hated nearly every lap because i had the 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 issue from i think lap 28 of about 78 so 50 laps unbelievable was, that's what i thought that's and as soon as i felt this loss of power again i'd done everything i needed to that weekend and i just put myself in the right position to win and then i came out of the casino square and I felt something and I couldn't, I don't know if I necessarily felt the lack of power yet, but I, I heard that I knew something was wrong. And then I pulled out of the hairpin, uh, Mirabeau is it or whatever. And then I don't know the names Lo of the corners. Loves. 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 And, uh, and I, I, I felt a loss of power and I just came on the radio and I told the guys and it wasn't anger. It was actually just devastation. And I, and I thought when you start losing power, you think it's going to keep dropping, dropping until the engine's done um but yeah i i got through a few more laps and and i asked the engineer i said is it going to get better he goes no and then i was like oh so i was like i gotta deal with this now for something 50 odd laps did and you no. manage to pull some positives from that moment again no this time no uh so not for always possible <laughs> no actually for, for a few laps i was uh let's say pretty negative and pretty down and i was like there's no way i'm gonna keep seb behind me i'm like we're already a bit of a power deficit on the straights. Horrible moments. And now we've got 160 horsepower horrible, less. Horrible. And I was just like, there's no way. And then probably five laps passed and I could see I was actually staying afloat and he was getting bloody close. But I was like, if I, if I get this clean, if I get that corner clean, that exit, 
I reckon I'll be able to defend. And fortunately, Monaco is tight. So then I started, my confidence came back and I kind of grew confidence uh, through the rest of the race. And I got to a point probably with, in my head, I told myself, if I get to 20 laps to go without uh, still being in the lead, I said, I'm not losing this race. So that was my like mini target. I said, get to 20 laps to go. So then I remember getting to that point. I was like, no one's taking this. And then, yeah. Wow, amazing how you was, built yourself up through that. Yeah, it was, it was a process. Uh, yeah. Did you have to change all the brake balances as well? Like brake balance massively forwards? Because yeah. yeah. I know because I had this, this in is 2014. What in, this is your the, first race win. Yeah. Me. I said, I'm not losing this race. Unfortunately, uh, you did better than me because I lost out to you. And yeah. you, actually, you actually won it. In your defense, in your defense, there was longer straights on, on Montreal. So you, you had a bit more time to bleed. Yeah, but my car was but, also three times quicker than your, <laughs> than yeah. your Red Bull in 2008. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, so because, but that, imagine that in Monaco, brake balance probably 5% forwards yeah. in Monaco. A lot of lifting and coasting. Massive lift and coast because you're burning so much more fuel. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That takes some adapting yeah. in, this, in this horrible, high pressure, distraught moment that's that's impressive yeah it was it was and you know what at the time i probably because i had so much going on i wasn't aware of how much i was needing to manage and it was only after the race and after that weekend where the team and i could see like my engineer he was literally like he had no and this is no disrespect to him but with all the problems we had during that race he had no belief that we were going to win so when i saw his face after I, I kind of realized that I'd done something pretty great to get to get it to the line, like to even finish. They're like, we don't even know how, how you got it home. So, so I, I don't want to blow smoke, but just it was, I didn't realize it because you're just so focused and you're in it and you just, you're constantly dealing and adapting lap after lap. But when I saw the emotion on the team, I realized that what we'd done was, was pretty awesome. I'll it, say we, I won't say I, I said what we done. <laughs> That's better. Your engineer, when he was speaking to you during those first five laps of really tough, did you feel his disappointment as yeah. well? Like his, he thought it was the end? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That so makes it even more tough though, doesn't it? Yes. In so that moment, could you just feel his disappointment and, you, and, and he's like, the message is bringing across, it's, this is over. Yes, and, that, and I think that's what he thought as well. So he, I think you probably agree, like a lot of the time your engineer feeds off you and you feed off your engineer. Exactly, massive, uh, massive it's, communication importance there, emotionally. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I agree totally. And that's, so when he, when I said, is, is the problem gonna get fixed or better? And then he said, no, it isn't. And the tone he said, no, it isn't. I knew, I was like, this is, this is done. Um, but then, as I said, once we started doing a few more laps and you know, I would start to maybe pick up my radio communication, then I could tell his tone of voice was getting a bit more positive and and then by the end, I remember with a few laps to go, I think he said, all right, you got like four laps to go, like you're doing awesome. Um, and he gave me like an instruction and I just said, mate, I got this buddy. Like, and I just gave him that kind of closure and that I'm good and <laughs> cool. to leave me the F alone. Awesome. Cause I want the next few laps by myself. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah so I actually did a lot of work on this uh, with my engineer because I, I I'd had the same engineer for 10, 10 of my 11 F1 years, always the same engineer. Whoa. Um, yeah, so my first year and my last year was the same engineer all the way through. Um, That's and pretty special. I did a lot of work with him on this because he was also always so real to me. When he was disappointed on the pit wall and had no more hope, he would show it to it. me immediately on the radio. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of work together that I was explaining to him how important it is for him to whatever happens, keep fiery and keep positive and keep pushing me and keep mm -hmm. optimistic. And he also there changed so much and that was really powerful even for my last year in F1 then. He would always keep building me up in, in like crucial moments. Yeah. So that was really, uh, really cool progress. Yeah, so powerful. And I don't um, think they realize it until no, you exactly. address it. But. Well, the, the, they often forget that we're human beings in the car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they, and it's they, they think we're an extension of their lines on the computer. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Yeah, Very often true. the engineers who are mathematical <laughs> geniuses, um, they think we're true. just extensions of those lines that they see on their computers and forget that we actually have emotions in that car and, and we sometimes have fear and worries and self-doubt and, and all of that. Um, so that's also something that you, it's important to try and remind them uh, from time to time. You've yeah. had those same experiences, though. Well. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> it's and it's it's so true. And that's been a challenge actually this year. Is you know, so I worked with Simon for all my Red Bull years. So that was I think five years. Um, and now this year at Renault, I got a, a new engineer. So getting that's that's kind of under kind of underestimated as well as how important that relationship is and and 
not only him being smart enough to engineer the car, but that communication and, and getting to know each other's language and again, knowing when to pick each other up and showing confidence and showing fight. Um, so that's that's been you know a, a process, but it's been really cool and um, yeah, it's it's powerful. You know, your engineer is it has to be your best friend. Oh shit! I'm sorry. Now I I forgot my uh, I forgot my track here. Um, and engineer has to be your best friend. Yeah, of course. That's a uh, um, we'll cut that out. Uh, best. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that will leave it. Uh, best overtaker. Come on, we'll go to that. You're the honey badger of Formula One. You're the best overtaker. Um, this is just your, you having learned to go in and attack into those difficult situations just full on and not be fearful because you know that that's where you get the most opportunities, the chance to improve, right? That's a bit yeah. your new learned approach, right? Yeah, that was, and that was actually, yeah, I wanted to touch on it earlier when we discussed the honey badger and the reason as well for me like putting myself out there and, and changing my approach with the racing and being aggressive was there was too many times you know throughout my whole career where I would leave the track on a Sunday night feeling sorry for myself and basically leaving with regrets if only I tried that if only I did that you know the gap was there I should have done it why didn't I try and there was all I was constantly like going through that and it, it felt terrible and I felt like I wasn't doing it justice, you know, my, myself or people that were supporting me. So I kind of just made also when I, I guess, adopted the honey badger, I, I kind of made that pact to myself that I would rather try and fail. So try and, and potentially crash than not try at all. You know, I, I can live with myself so much better if I have a go. And I think also the people around me, un unless I'm being reckless, you know, they're going to respect me. So. And then it, it kind of once once I started getting it, then, you know, your confidence builds and, and you have confidence to keep doing it. And it feels good. It feels great. And, you know, I, I did fail a few times, but it was so much better than just sitting behind someone the whole race and being hesitant to pull the trigger because you don't you get nothing from that, you know, unless you're in the last race fine for a championship. And that's a different scenario, but it's not. Um, yeah, I just I, it's so much more fulfilling going for it and, and leaving it all out there because. I guess why why else? I know it doesn't really make sense any other way really. <laughs> Let's go for a Michael Jordan quote. I know he was on your on your mm. uh, kids' room's wall. Yeah. And he was a big inspiration to you. And the quote from him is you miss a hundred percent of the shots that you don't take. Yeah. That's exactly. a cool quote. Really cool. So come on everybody, let's go for it. Really cool. Let's take those shots. Yeah. Right? And I, I encourage that with Ed, anyone in and that's obviously in a racing term and, and him in, in basketball reference, but it's it can be with anything and, and even like my friends, you know, I'll, when I see that and I, you got to be careful, but sometimes I'm just like, I'll just I want to say it how it is. And, you know, if some of my friends aren't happy with their life or their job or what they're doing, I'm just like, well, what's what's the point? Like, why are you still doing this? Like, what are you afraid of? And just go for it. Try. And if you fail, who cares? Like so, some of my friends have talked about maybe leaving leaving Perth and, and traveling abroad and finding a job and whatever. And I'm like, all right, if you travel and, and it doesn't work and you don't find a job that works or you love, you got nothing to lose. You, you're going to have so much experience from the traveling that you won't go home with your tail between your legs. Like you'll, you'll be fulfilled in, in some way or another. And um, yeah, I guess it's just important that like we only do get, sorry, I'm going a bit deep, but we do only get like one chance at, at all this. It's like, for me, it just seems silly not to make the most of it and at least try, try be something or do something than just exist. That's an awesome life approach. And uh, I'll give you some credit at this point. Whenever you would appear in my rear wing, in my rear view mirrors, <laughs> yeah. it would be <laughs> the most uh, non nice feeling because <laughs> I know That's I was, plan. <laughs> I know I was at the highest risk of anybody else uh, to, to lose my position now yeah. and, uh, and to succumb to an attempt at a, a crazy lunge, which usually works for you. Um, so I'll give you credit for that. Thanks. I, the Bud Budapest 2015. It didn't work yeah, well that, for uh, us. Yeah, but, but that, that was, I was pretty far back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't so had a podium ended, in a that while. That ended with me in a puncture. But <laughs> I'll probably take most of the blame myself. But anyway, it ended with me in a puncture and you breaking your front wing a little bit, but you still finished third. So I'll give you credit for that. Uh, that's, I'll be honest now, that's the feeling I always had when I saw you behind. All right, I was thanks. like, oh no, not him again. Come on, couldn't it be anybody else? <laughs> thanks for um, your honesty. But now actually, so 
I think there might be something where I can give you a little piece of advice because I'm not racing anymore. So um, whenever it. you overtake uh, 70, and I'm doing this as a thank you for, for uh, uh, let's see yeah, if I can, um, thank you for ta taking the time and also for extracting all these uh, cool lessons for all of us who are listening. Um, whenever you do overtake and you go for lunges, very often 75% of the time you do lock up the front inside, yep. which is something that um, is a little imperfection still in that. Sure. Do you, um, my, so question, do you, what I learned in my career was whenever you kind of know you're going to go for the lunge already quite early, uh, you would, th or the, the possibility is there. Yeah, so you I probably, know what you're about to you say. You probably start to know because it's lap after lap, you start analyzing and you know the lunge is coming. Mm -hmm. With the distance from the last corner, you know, okay, this lap is going to be it. Um, I learned to flick my brake balance rearwards <laughs> and ramp up the engine braking um, at the beginning of that straight mm -hmm. for the very high eventuality that I'm going to go for that lunge. Yeah. And that is a huge improvement for not locking up that front inside and just gives you that even more capacity to, to go in deep and, mm. and make the pass stick and not run wide. Do you do that? Um, not <laughs> that's thanks for the number. That's good for me to know. <laughs> we could, we, we don't have to put this on. We could just keep it to ourselves, but, um, but you know, to be honest, I don't always do it because sometimes I, I haven't been doing it long enough that it's habit yet. So sometimes in the heat of battle, I forget to do it. So it's not something I always do. You haven't no. been doing lunges long enough? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember true, in my true. memory, it's two per race. <laughs> what are you waiting yeah, for? Yeah. No, sorry. I'm not long. When I say long enough, the, the break, break balance ah, thing. Ah, okay, yeah. okay, okay. So okay. I, I wasn't doing this back in the day. No. Okay. So. And on the engine brake. The engine braking I wasn't. Because so. that's the one that gives you the l very, very late um, big improvement okay. on, on rearward engine brake, which is the one you need most. Because the you. very, very last one. <laughs> Don't worry, anybody, no one, no one else well, from I F1 is listening to this. <laughs> so it's just pure well, advice I, I'm to gonna you. Need, I'm going to need it now because uh, certainly certainly the you know the strength of the Red Bull was was definitely in that phase. And um, you know currently with, with the Renault, it's, it has been a bit trickier um to to be more precise on the braking and that so it's going to help me out thanks okay, so if you see if you see, it, if you see some good lunges <laughs> in in uh in the next few races then you can give yourself a shout out so <laughs> these small details this one gave me the world championship because in my pass on max verstappen in abu dhabi yes i was going to bring that up and if i would have had the slightest lock on the front tire i would have i would have run into max and lost my front wing because we were right next to each other yeah. and i lunged from it was 20 meters back or something crazy, something, something like that. But I knew at the beginning of that straight, I'm going for the lunch today, uh, now. Didn't have a choice anyways, because my engineer said on my, on my ear in the not so confident tone this time, because <laughs> the championship was at stake. Nico, if you don't try and pass Max, now you're going to lose the championship. <laughs> so I knew I was going for it anyways. Went for the uh, two settings changes and it just stuck. It stuck so beautifully. It was clean. And, and I remember, I remember not watching it. Not the slightest lock up on the front. And, uh, and that gave me the championship. If I locked up, I was in max because he doesn't leave you uh, any five centimeters too much. Yeah. I mean, he, he will, <laughs> he squeeze. will squeeze to the minimum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was one of those uh, small details where, um, where I can also just always encourage to, to really focus on the small steps. And was that um, something that you learned over time or an yeah, engineer? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, this just is, through, uh, this yeah. is, uh, I really always try to try to improve so much in every single possible area. And, and this was one area you maximizing the use of settings yeah. for all the different circumstances, even a qualifying lap from corner to corner, um, or, or going for lunges or whatever other circumstances are like race starts, optimizing settings for every single situation, because they're That's so damn powerful. It's like you can transform the car and every situation requires a different car. Mm -hmm. a, a different car um, setting, setup, handling, which you can totally achieve with your settings. So for all those it different is, circumstances. It's one, one thing I've noticed in, in past years is watching onboards, Mercedes drivers make more switches than anyone else. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Is the car that Works. hard to drive? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, what, where, where are we going into? Let's go, you had some awesome teammates, um, Seb Max. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to, I, I want to avoid using the, um, asking you the usual journalist questions because I know that they just suck, but uh, of course for the listener, that's really interesting. Maybe especially in the way of what can we learn from those guys? What did you pick out from, 
from Seb. Mm -hmm. um, you destroyed him, if I may say, in my words. <laughs> uh, and you're the only guy in the in the world for now to have destroyed him in that way. Leclerc ah, is yeah. uh, Leclerc now has a has a Chocolate. chance at yeah. the at the moment it seems. Let's see how how it goes. But he could have turned into an upper hand similar to the one you had, maybe. But you really destroyed him. But was there anything, anyways, that you were able to learn from from Seb? I mean, you were really young. You came into the team. What was he doing amazingly? Because he's a four-time world champion at the time. Yeah, I, I was I was excited for that challenge and and the on-track challenge, but also to see how he worked off off track. And I think um, a lot of attention to detail. You know, he's I think he lives and breathes racing. Um, in terms of, I, I felt he didn't have many other hobbies. You know, it was it was pretty much racing, and he was really just absorbed a lot by it. Um, so just time with the engineers, and also he he had a good way of communicating. He, I think he was firm, but not disrespectful. You know, so he would tell if if something wasn't good enough, he would say it's not good enough. We can do better. But it was in a way which yeah, it it, it got the message across, and it was as I said firm, but he was direct, but still kind still shook everyone's hand like yeah there was just he, he had a good balance i guess and uh so yeah probably just the work ethic um impressive and with max i think you know one thing i definitely saw and and realize and understand is is it it definitely helps out of myself when i didn't think i could and he probably could say the same, you know, and, and I really think that we pushed each other more and more and got that extra two tenths that sometimes we didn't think was there. So, um, you know, with Max, one thing, he was just quick out of the box as well, like FP1 first lap, just go. Like there wasn't much of a feeling out process. Um, I think he drives on a lot of probably just instinct and um, he just goes. So, um, yeah, there wasn't much of a building up and, you know, a new track kind of feeling it and getting the tires in. Um, so he's still, I guess, technical, but he's probably got less, I think Seb, much more of a sensitive driver, a lot more sensors in his body to kind of communicate with the car where Max drives probably more off instinct and, and raw, raw talent. It seems a bit like the Michael Schumacher, Lewis Hamilton comparison for me. It's very, very similar. Yeah. It's Michael Schumacher is very similar to Seb. The mm -hmm. details. Maybe it's a German team, thing. The, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> possibly, actually. Yeah. Uh, the team communication, the leadership, you know, really um, driving everybody in the same direction as a, as a leader as well. Mm -hmm. um, really, really cool to see with Michael. And Lewis is just similar to what you said about Max. Just much more that unbelievable raw... Um, raw talent and, and less so of the whole calculated rational working ethic details uh, mm -hmm. things like that it's there as well but not to the not to the extent I guess that's uh, maybe quite similar so uh, who, if and who's quicker Seb Max if you had to pick one um, on one lap single lap straight out of the box yeah Max <laughs> yeah yeah um, and that's law I yeah I won't take anything away from Seb like Seb is not slow by any means um but uh, I would say on raw speed, probably more as well because Max is still young. And I think if he's quick now, he's probably only going to get quicker where Seb's been doing it that long. I think you'll always improve as a driver, but there's probably less room to grow for Seb and there's more for Max. So, yeah, I'll, I'll say that. But if Seb's listening, sorry, Seb. <laughs> You're still a badass. It's all right. <laughs> um, change, change is terrifying, you said. Ah, but ah, but you terrible. still you still learn in life that that's where you um, get the most excitement and the most growth for yourself in life. And is that also mm -hmm. one of the reasons then why you went for this huge, uh, in your words, one of the biggest life changes ever uh, and life decisions, no, mm -hmm. to go from Red Bull to Renault? Yeah, absolutely. I I think one thing I I guess I, I've learned over time and and with. I guess in, in, in all aspects through through my sport, but in, in general with life. And I think it's important to evolve. I think that's a, it's a nice word because as evolve as a person, evolve as, a, as an athlete, whatever, um, to kind of constantly grow and try to push yourself. And, and I felt um, at Red Bull, I guess, it was, I was, I, I didn't feel like I could do much more. You know, I was, it was fairly limited and the window was kind of closing. I, I was working you know, with the same people for quite a while now. And, and we'd been obviously trying to get to that world title, but we kept coming up short. And 
Yeah, I just I felt like it was probably just a little bit of a in a way routine sometimes and and I just felt I needed something else to also switch my mindset and to in a way force me to to grow and evolve and um and that's that was really part of the a big part of the reason to to move and and to switch it up so yeah it was it was for sure like scary because it was a bit of an unknown of course but um I haven't looked back and and as soon as I made the decision I felt like it was the right thing and and I knew it wasn't going to be easy and and I know now there's still a lot of work to do but personally already I feel really fulfilled and even so far this year, I feel the work I'm putting in and, and my attention to detail, like I'm getting more out of myself. So I, I, can't, I can't argue with that. So would you say maybe that you've learned to, to the importance of pushing yourself into discomfort and, and pushing yourself to grow, it brings you more happiness as well? Is that what you've learned for, for your life? Yeah, I, I think so, you know, and, and does it mean I'm happy, you know, running around in eighth or something? No, I'll, I'll only be completely happy when I'm winning. But at that sense of absolutely like fulfillment and leaving leaving a race weekend um, with, I don't know, just a bit more of a, yeah, because even sometimes like a podium, I mean, podiums are great, but, you know, I'll, I don't know, sometimes even on a podium, I'll be like, ah, oh, could I have done more? Could I have done better maybe? And, and then, I don't know, I guess now, even if it's not a great result on paper, I feel like wow okay we we worked i worked really well with the team we got the car from here to here still not where we want to be but yeah i don't know it's just there's something there's something extra now which i'm finding which which is cool and hopefully it eventually forms a two a two uh, uh sorry a, a two word prize starting with w and then it with a, with a c but uh yeah yeah i'm trying two, to be two. clever i'm not clever <laughs> a world a championship two, a two prize <laughs> yeah let's call winning the world championship a two prize yeah there you go but uh <laughs> but it's been all right it's been all right have you have you do you understand your um your purpose already in life is that still something you're looking for or have you understood it at, at the moment i mean it's winning the two prize um but, yeah. or, but you do you already know your bigger um purpose in life have you figured that out uh it's a good question i i I've probably never been asked that direct before. Um, I definitely feel, yeah, I mean, I feel the racing is more than just racing. And I see it now with age that, you know, what I'm doing, yes, it's what I want to do. And I've got the target to be world champion, but it's having a ripple effect, you know, throughout other areas of life. And like people are coming up to me, like that's when it feels really quite nice is someone comes up to me like, oh, you, you helped me get through this hard time or, oh, you know, my, my mum was sick and seeing your smile on TV and hearing your thing, like that helped us so much through it. And like some, some crazy things like that, which, um, yeah, so as far as a purpose, um, I guess the way maybe I go about things and, and keep that perspective and that positive side of the way I go about racing or just life, I guess is having a positive effect on some people. and. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I don't actively try to like be that person, but it obviously the way I'm doing it is having an effect. So that's nice. Um, beyond racing, I, I don't know yet. I don't know. We'll see. But um, I would love to, I would love to, as much as I love racing, I would love to find another real passion in life and to find something else to pursue once it's all done. And um yeah, I guess find another purpose on a, on a professional level, but not sure yet. Nice, nice that you're so aware of how inspiring you are, though, in what you're doing with so many people around the world, because huh? that's yeah, that's, that's powerful. Yeah, it's and it feels weird, like it feels weird even talking about it. But again, I'm I'm at an age now where I can probably understand and acknowledge it, and it is nice. Um, if you can, if you can change someone's day or. I don't know to have that effect. It's weird because I, I don't feel like I'm anyone different to anyone else. But yeah, it's I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but you are in the, you're in the 99.9th percentile in, in human performance. 
yeah. with what you're doing and and the attitude that <laughs> the attitude <laughs> that, and this is what I love about pos- podcasting that it's uh, really I'm getting so many comments below of wow that's so inspirational lessons from the guests that I've uh, that I've brought on and and uh, please if you're uh, watching on YouTube on this occasion please as well comment below because um, it's always nice to hear and and I'm I'm happy to uh, to uh, reply as well and it's, it's really cool that's youtube is such a positive platform as well and yeah. podcasting I, I think so that's what i love about uh, about doing podcasts and i'm sure again with all that you've been talking about yeah, there's going to be some amazing uh, amazing inspirations for for the for you who's listening i'm very sure of that um one well, more of the final oh, sorry. i was just going to say uh, podcasts are great and i i've really got into the last few years and um even this now like being able just to have a conversation and with no distractions with no unfortunately you go out if you go out to dinner with friends and that and you try and start having a conversation then someone brings out their phone and it's 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 always a bit broken and um i don't know i think podcast is great because it encourages just real conversation with just pure facetime no other distraction and i mean this is the longest conversation we've ever had in (laughs) you know how many years of traveling so it's cool but um yeah what what was your i'll just quickly ask you a question if that's cool what was your um what drew you towards i guess having a podcast and and is it just you you enjoy the conversation or you you feel you could learn more through other people <coughs> no that's um uh, that's quite simple um so the, the the purpose of the podcast is i really wish to extract these life lessons for all of us for for me who's listening to you now and, and for everybody who's listening that's m- what i really want to achieve because I find it very inspiring. Uh, for example, there's Tony Robbins out there mm-hmm. or, or Tim Ferriss, uh, which are the greatest podcasters. Yeah. Or one of my favorite actually is The School of Greatness. And by the way, um, I was reading the book this morning and took a lot of points, which I've asked you today from that book, okay. from The School of Greatness. One other point, which is gonna come in a second, uh, Lewis Howes. And it's also, it's so, it's so cool and, and I love that. And, and I've taken so much for myself and this is what I wanna try and achieve as well now with my podcast to, to give back to everybody who's, who's listening. Um, and because as well, it's a topic that I've, I've worked so much on. So I think I've come to a point where I, I do have certain understandings for some things uh, in this whole area of personal development and self-improvement um, because I worked, because I had um, studied philosophy for 10 years and, and worked with a psychologist for 10 years, and especially in the last year of winning the World Championship so intensely. And so I have a lot of, uh, and there's an ocean of knowledge out there which we're all not tapping into. Mm-hmm. And I can only encourage to, we were speaking about it in the car, yeah. and you were like, are you sure that's a good idea? Like, isn't that a bit scary to see all that, <laughs> all that's out there in terms of uh, possible uh, mental improvements or, or, yeah. or struggles or all the rest of it that you can learn about? And I was like, no, no. It's unbelievable the because uh, everything that the two of us will feel on a, on a daily basis has been felt before by a genius in the past who's been able to write it down in a book in the way that we can understand it very easily. Everything that we experience has already has already been experienced previously in any extreme form or whatever. And so when you then read about it in a way that it's really easy to understand, it sort of it often just clicks for you. And understanding is powerful because mm-hmm. if you understand why you're jealous why you're scared, why you're angry. It will, much, it will help you so much in, in understanding. It help you to react in a more uh, appropriate way um, with a bit of time. And it's, it's just extremely powerful and it has a snowball effect then. So I can only recommend to everybody who's listening. Right. Uh, start with reading the School of Greatness book. Yeah. Very nice, okay. really, really cool. And it's also an ex-sportsman, um, uh, ex-American uh, football. What, what's um, his name? Lewis Howes. Lewis Howes. Yeah. All right. Uh, and, and Lewis, if you're listening, I want to come on your podcast, please, as a guest. <laughs> All right. uh, I would be honored. Okay. Uh, <laughs> wait, one more thing then. Goals. You said um, you said you want to be world champion. In uh, a lot of the uh, most famous people, they take the time to write down their goals specifically on a piece of paper and remind themselves of the short-term, long-term goals on a daily basis, keep looking, and, and it really gives a direction in life. Um, so you're not going all over the place with your head. Have you done that for yourself or is it just in your head that you've set your goals and, and can you take us through them? Uh, so I, I haven't actually written down um, that, I guess, set goals. I mean, yeah, in my head, I know what I want to achieve, but yeah, yeah I haven't said by this race or by, by July, I want to be here and there. It's probably a good thing. And actually, I've just recently started um, writing a journal or a diary. Ah, oh, that's super um, powerful as well. Insane. Amazing. Insane. Like... It is so, I don't know how it's, it sounds so silly and not silly, but so simple, but 
the release and because you're just you're writing to yourself and you're so honest and it's just completely transparent and it's 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 like you're venting and releasing a whole lot of thoughts emotions and it, it's awesome so that is maybe that's my my step towards then writing down these goals but that already has has been super awesome for me um you know the past couple months and yeah so and even just to i mean i see you've done it like even just it sounds silly but to hand write it feels good like we we obviously did it at school now it's just so much you know typing on your phone or whatever and to to just sit down there and write it's it's kind of meditating and and i've enjoyed that a lot um and then so for goals um yeah i'll i'll come back to you on it but i think you know just being general with let's say my move to reno is is i i really i want obviously i want it to work but i want to feel like i've i've really had a contribution you know and i want to feel like everything i've done has been for the right reasons and it's it's motivated the team it's pushed the team towards being something that i believe they can be and i I believe they believe that as well um so i I can't put a position on it this year it's it's more than just what position we're going to come it's it's having an impact and and as you said a bit about michael you know he had such a an influence in the team and bringing them together and i think it's a real opportunity for me to try and um exploit that opportunity in that position and that role so um yeah just have some ownership some responsibility and do the damn thing (laughs) but that's an awesome goal to set because impact is something that is completely in your control how Mm -hmm. much impact you have yeah. And uh, if you set your goal on the result, there's so many things that are just out of your control. So high chance that it'll cause you a lot of uh, a lot of pain. But if you mm-hmm. are on impact, that's such a cool uh, cool way to set your goal. And and, and co- co- collective impact as a team and your impact going into the team and team spirit. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's a really really um, awesome approach. Um, f- final words. I'm really really thankful. Um, our final words of, of uh, um, advice to the younger kids. Or, or the teenagers listening, please. Um, I mean, I, I guess I touched on it a bit before, but do you want me to look at you or the down the lens? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you right. can do the, do the lens. That's uh, all right. Go I'll look it. at you. Go for it. it. Makes it more no, no, go for it. Down the lens. Which one? In the middle. In the middle. <laughs> oh, I, no, it's, it's putting more pressure on it now. Not only um, the racers, the ones who want to achieve something in, yeah. in life and, and look up to you. I think, you know, the the one from, from my own experience is that I was first and foremost you have to enjoy what you're doing and again it sounds so simple and it's so basic but i think sometimes the most basic things are the the best and the you know the most obvious so have fun um i know my best results you know in in my sport have come through the days that i've been enjoying it and having fun and um you know you feel weightless and it brings a a level of confidence and desire um and many hurdles will come along the way and things change but that is so important to really love it and it has to be there are some you know i guess pushy parents out there in the world and and unfortunately sometimes it's their dream and not their kids but it definitely has to be your dream and i don't know i guess i i'm not going to go too deep i'll literally just say it has to be the one thing that you love doing more than anything else and yeah i think then it's so much easier to work put the work in for it if you're enjoying it you know it won't feel like work you know the hours you're putting in to be better will feel just uh, that could be fun as well but yeah not that deep not that inspiring but <laughs> i'll add a few and, and so i guess it's really the courage to uh, to remain true to yourself mm-hmm. that's really the most important to try and it's so hard yes it's so so hard yes. i'm miles away from it still myself although i'm trying um but i think that's the biggest uh, message i guess be courageous yes true to yourself that's and now with you know it's it's probably going to be even harder for the youth coming up now with with social media with all these outside pressures expectations don't and and you see it all the time people are trying to be some it's all right to look up to people 100 percent, but be you and do your thing that makes you tick and makes you happy and create your own path and and be bold enough and brave enough to do do things your way um but yeah, it's easy to get lost. So that's where I, I definitely give credit to my family and just having good friends around you. You know, you will make new friends along the way. That's cool and that's fine. But don't forget your 
your day ones because they're the ones that will always bring you back if you're getting a bit bit lost out in that crazy world we live in <laughs> okay thank you very much last thing my daughter asked me to give you this uh, gift is from her car <laughs> no she she said this morning i said i'm going to do a podcast with daniel and she's like daddy daddy, uh, daddy please please give him this from me <laughs> you know what your daughter she's three and a half Three and a half, yeah. But she, she watches the races with me. Well, she's very clever because it's the left mirror, which is exactly of the course, one I did course. not look in. Of course. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. There you go. I still will be able to laugh about it one day. I guess today is the day. <laughs> so, uh, dear listener, if you're on audio, I have to, sorry, go I have to it. fill in the That's moment right. a little bit. So I just gave Daniel uh, the rear view mirror on the left-hand side of my daughter's little tiny Mercedes car um, because... Um, she was concerned that your mirror must have been broken in, in Azerbaijan recently at the race when you reversed uh, right into the car that was parked behind you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Guilty. So smart, do- smart daughter I have. Eh? <laughs> She's learned well. <laughs> She's learned well from you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks thank for you, having thanks, me. Thanks for listening. And uh, all of us uh, wish you, of course, all the best for the rest of the season and that you achieve your dreams and goals that you've uh, set out to do. Thank you kindly. Thanks. Quick snippet outro here. Please comment below. Oops. <laughs> if you would like me to set up a date with uh, Alina and Daniel. What? Please comment below. <laughs> <laughs>